losing track of where I end and here begins. Dr. Etzel Cardenia is a clinical psychologist employed by the American Department of Defense. His research is into altered states of consciousness. And Janet Crossley has a special talent for self-hypnosis. Through anything else you can tell me at this point. Through Janet, Dr. Cardenia is hoping to connect with the minds of our most distant ancestors and enter their primitive world. back home after a long time away. Over a hundred years, we have searched for traces of our earliest ancestors to find out how our species emerged. Were the cave dwellers of the distant past pre-human creatures, or were they at all like us? Hidden inside this French cave, 19th century archaeologists found a tiny carving of a human-like head. Called the Venus of Rassompuy, we now know that she is 25,000 years old. But who were the creatures who made her? Were they our species or something else? When did people like us first appear on the Earth? Today, archaeologists need to discover the first real humans before they can understand our deepest origins. A team from Bordeaux has come to explore a small area where the cave roof once opened to the sky. Searching through the silt, the archaeologists come across a horde of remains. First, a flint fragment. And then more. Another flint, but with a sharpened edge, like a blade. There's a fox's tooth. and the bones of other animals abandoned on the cave floor just a few meters from the place where the Venus was found. At their site office, the archaeologists analyze the large collection of animal bones from the cave. They hope that these bones will tell them something about what went on there. Looking closely at them, they see minute cut marks, the telltale traces of defleshing. Flint tools were being used in the cave to get at the animal meat. 
These bones are domestic rubbish. The cave was perhaps a home to creatures intelligent enough to make tools and to use tools 25,000 years ago. The bits of bone and the bits of stone that archaeologists excavate are not important in and of themselves. Archaeologists look at the relationship between these objects, look at the patterns that we, we see in them, and then create some significance to these things. And it's by looking at those patterns, looking at those relationships, that we can start asking questions about the people who made them. Not only asking questions about the people who made them, but also about ourselves in relationship to these people. And we can start thinking about, were those people like us in any way? To the Garonne floodplain from Brassempuy are the foothills of Kersi. And here, our ancestors have left another kind of evidence that may help us understand what kind of creatures they were. Once again, in caves, there are traces of their physical presence. A footprint. And something else, markings on the rock. Drawings. They're the same age as the bones the archaeologists have discovered. It looks as if the painters drew the animals they saw around them. Strangely, the archaeologists have found nothing to suggest that people ever lived here. And 200 meters from the entrance of the cave, there's something more. A pair of horses, covered with a halo of red and black dots, and adorned with the painter's handprints. But there are no other remains, nothing at all. It seems they came, painted the horses, and left. Sometimes it's very frustrating looking at these images. It's like a story with illustrations. We don't have that story um, from the ancient minds that made these paintings. We have to think of some other way of trying to understand what that story is, what it is that those ancient people were trying to, to, to portray in those images that they painted on the walls of the caves. If we could make sense of these images, for the first time, we might understand how the minds of our ancestors worked, if they were at all like us. But until now, the archeologists have failed. The meaning of the images remains a mystery. On the other side of the world, Thomas Dowson and his colleague, David Lewis Williams, believe they're on the verge of a breakthrough in understanding the European cave paintings. It's based on discoveries made high in the cliffs of the great South African escarpment.
Here too, there are pictures on the rock. Paintings of antelopes cover the sandstone walls. The connection between these and the French caves is something that has struck people for many, many years. Like the French caves, these are paintings, a lot of animals, beautifully painted animals. They are done one on top of the other in superpositions. Um, sometimes they are interacting, as it were, with the rock face. More than half the rock paintings are of the eland antelope. But the pictures are so complex that only by tracing them can the archaeologists know precisely what is there. Further up the cliff face is an extraordinary painting of an eland together with some human figures. Here, the painter has captured an instant of time with uncanny accuracy, the moment of the eland's death. When an eland dies, it staggers on its front legs, its weight pushes down the front legs, its head comes down, the neck comes down like this, and its head swings uncontrollably like that as it loses control of its muscles and here you can see the eland is looking directly at us with its hollow eyes the artist's observations are precise here the eland's legs are shown crossed in death But now the painter records a moment which is quite unreal. One of the figures is holding on to the animal's tail. His face is completely unhuman. Like the eland, his legs are crossed. He even has eland hooves. It's almost as if the human figures in the painting are imitating the dying eland. Explorers reported that these pictures were the work of scattered groups of hunter-gatherers who once lived in these mountains, the Bushmen. Like the early European cave paintings, the pictures seem to describe a complex world of stories and mythology. But these were made only a few hundred years ago, almost within living memory. The archaeologists believe that the stories behind these paintings could be a way into the lost world of the cave people 25,000 years ago. I'm going to help you to go into an even deeper state of hypnosis. And I'm going to help you by just counting slowly from 1 to 30. Zero represents being wide awake. 1 to 10 represents being feeling slightly different than normal. Dr. Cardenia's investigation into the human mind involves 28 specially selected volunteers with a very rare talent. Like Janet Crossley, all are gifted at self-hypnosis. Uh, from 41 onwards, very deep hypnosis, open-ended. You can go as deep into hypnosis as you want. So very slowly now, it's one, two. But this is an unusual kind of hypnosis. Cardenia will be making no suggestions to Janet. Four, Instead, the aim is to five, shut down her awareness of the modern world around her leaving her mind free to function on its own. Six. In hypnosis, you are in an enhanced form of suggestibility. So if you give a suggestion, the person, at least the highly hypnotizable person, is likely to experience it. So the question is, if you minimize the suggestions or eliminate them, is there something that very highly hypnotizable people may experience when they say that they are in a state of hypnosis? After 20 minutes, Janet begins to have experiences which have nothing to do with the real world. 
She's in a state of altered consciousness. There is a pulsating white light, but it's becoming more colorful. Dr. Cardenia believes that this may be what he's looking for. Mental events which derive solely from the workings of the human mind, not from experiences of the modern world. State? 40. Okay. Well, it's like a tunnel of colors, and it feels like I'm going up through a tunnel of colors. The mantis was the one who put Komanga's shoe in the water. In an archive in Cape Town, there's a collection of Bushman stories. Then the mantis made an eland with Komanga's shoe. It's a record of the ancient spoken language of the Bushman. The eland et, causing himself to grow with the mantis's honey. The stories are very obscure. They emphasize elands, just like the paintings. But for Lewis Williams, the language of the stories offers a clue. The language that the Bushmen spoke is now extinct. Nobody speaks that language anymore, so this is the only record that we have of it. But it's only one of a whole family of Bushmen languages, not just one Bushmen language. And other languages, like uh, Kung and Kui and Ko is still, those languages are still being spoken far to the north in the Kalahari Desert. Until recently, the Kalahari Desert was inhabited only by small bands of nomadic hunters. These are the Jutwansi, people who still speak a Bushman language. They no longer live by hunting in the old way, but their beliefs are still traditional. We knew that they had never made paintings, but from the work that anthropologists had carried out in the Kalahari, we knew that they were living fairly traditional lifestyles. The Dutuansi live hundreds of miles from the Drakensberg rock shelters, but Dalson has brought tracings of the paintings to show them. These are copies of um, pictures from the Drakensberg. Mm -hmm. For the Jutwansi, the eland has sacred power, which people like Kunta can share. And what about this figure here? They can move on to here. The Jutuansi dance at night to summon the Elan power. The Elan dance lasts for several hours. As it continues, something strange happens to Kunta. 
the noise and the rhythm begin to shut out reality and send him into a trance, into a state of altered consciousness. In their trance, dancers see the spirit of the eland as visions in the darkness and believe they take on its power. Anthropologists call this kind of ritual shamanic. Kunta is a shaman. What we've been seeing here is a classic shamanistic trance ritual and this relates to very similar experiences that people have all over the world and this is because the kinds of experiences that shamans have in an altered state of consciousness are the same. The way in which they talk about them is often very similar as well. People talk about traveling underground, going through a tunnel, dying and coming alive again. They talk about flying, a sense of weightlessness floating above everybody around them. They also use animal spirit helpers in order to go on these journeys to the spirit world. The colors of what shape? Do they have any shape? They keep changing and mixing. It's like they're flowing through each other and on top of each other and Sometimes mixing and making new colors, and sometimes not. I feel like I'm going to be able to float up into the colors soon. Like Kunta, Janet Crossley is also experiencing hallucinations. Have you seen any shapes, forms, anything of that sort? Any other sensations? Yes. Can you please tell me more about them? I was trying to figure out if it was a fish or if it was something else, and I think it was something else. Once their awareness of the outside world was gone, all of Cardenia's volunteers saw visions of some kind. They would go into a place where they may see a number of unusual images, surrealistic type of landscapes, a vast sea of darkness, or they may see just colors, bright colors, very rich, intense, vivid imagery. For Lewis Williams and Dowson, the Drakensberg paintings depict just this kind of imagery. To them, the pictures record hallucinations seen by shamans in trance. The paintings are not just paintings of everyday life. They depict the trance experience and the beliefs associated with it. But there are also a lot of hallucinatory elements that could only have been seen by medicine men in trance in the spirit world. I think the paintings and the graphic uh, ways of letting everybody know what those experiences were and helping to make belief in the spirit world possible for everybody in the community. The South African archaeologists began to wonder if the French cave paintings might also be evidence for belief in a spirit world 25,000 years ago. In France, the cave at Peshmel has begun to reveal its secrets. Detailed work by the French archaeologists 
has identified the unusual technique the cave painters used to get their characteristic airbrushed effect. The painters um, took the pigment in their mouth and spitting it in the wall and using their hand as a stencil to realize the outlines and then fill the figure uh, in the same way by spitting the pigment. And the French archaeologists have noticed a strange thing about the paintings in Peshmel. The animals are often painted right on top of one another, with no reference to what was there before, just like the South African pictures. There are a great many similarities between the paintings made in France and those made in Southern Africa. Looking at those similarities, you start thinking there must be something similar about the processes that produced these images in the first place. Dowson's sense of a connection between the French and South African cave paintings is strengthened by an unusual drawing in Peshmel. It's hidden away at the end of a narrow passage. It looks like a human being with painted lines coming out from its body, like arrows or spears. Worn by time, the drawing has been called the Wounded Man. Archaeologists have always found it puzzling. The drawings of men, of human beings, are very rare, and usually it is in hidden place. What does it mean? We don't know. <laughs> the meaning of the wounded man could be explained by the trance dance of the Jutwansi. It involves intense pain in the stomach and kidneys. Kunta's pain seems to match the picture of the wounded man. The archaeologists suspect that the drawing in the French cave is also a shaman. Spectacular. Cardania's study has produced some extraordinary results. At a particular stage in the trance, all his volunteers see the same kind of hallucination, strange visions of abstract geometric shapes. They move and they flow into each other. And sometimes they mix and sometimes they don't. What I found was that across individuals, and again, please bear in mind that these people were not in contact with each other. They were not in the same class. They did not know each other. I found out that there seemed to be more or less a general pattern. When people are experiencing unusual altered states of consciousness, they see some geometric patterns. There are about four or five constants. A number of them have to do with grids, just geometric figures that have to do with grids, spirals, 
faunals, tonals, figures of that, of that sort. Are you all right, Mr. Gowler? Yes, everything's fine. Good. Now, what I'm going to ask you to do is just close your eyes and to press the button whenever you see a hallucination. Okay? Okay, that's fine. Grid patterns are one of the most common forms of hallucination. They even appear to patients with eye disease. Edmund Gowler sees these grids spontaneously in areas where his vision is blank. Doctors believe it's because the brain is starved of information from damaged parts of the retina, just as it is starved of visual information in a trance. And then you have another series of straight lines like that, which have got lines across them to give you a grid pattern. What we think is happening is it's something to do with the way the brain is wired up, something to do with the architecture of the visual brain. And really, to, to uh, develop that theme further, we have to look at the brain as it's working. We have to capture a hallucination in a brain scanner, see which parts of the brain are actually lighting up during a hallucination. These hallucinations can last up to five minutes. The scanner captures a minute slice of the patient's brain each second. The scientists are able to see which parts of the brain are active at any given moment. This is a patient who's having grid hallucinations. This is when there's no hallucinations taking place. He's lying in the scanner. He's waiting for one to occur. When one occurs, he presses a button, and these are the areas of the brain that light up when he's hallucinating. Uh, we can see these little red dots here. They're in the back of the brain, in the occipital lobe. They're in an area that we would expect to light up when grids were hallucinated. These grid hallucinations aren't just caused by eye disease. They also occur to people with migraine, strokes, and other conditions. They are a universal product of the physical structure of the human brain. No one's ever systematically looked at uh, the exact geometry of these experiences. So the surprising feature was that when patients drew them or described them in more detail, they all turned out to be the same experience. Deep in the prehistoric caves, the archaeologists have found more than just animal paintings. The cave people drew a lot of abstract images. Some are geometric rows of colored dots. And many of the others are grid patterns, very like the ones observed in the brain scanner. No one has really studied these abstract markings until recently. But now their significance is becoming clear. Exactly the same kind of grids and dots appear in the Bushman paintings of their trance experience. Once we found out about the research on altered states of consciousness and the way in which people see hallucinations, we saw those kinds of images in the rock art of southern Africa. We then started comparing that with the images that we found in the French caves. And one of the most striking comparisons we can make is this image here, where you've got dots uh, superimposed on an eland's body. Um, there is also a grid painted into the eland's body, very, very similar to this horse that we find in Peshmel in the French caves, where the dots literally cover the, the body and go beyond the body of the horses. Now, for the first time, the scientists had hard evidence to suggest that trance and hallucination were the key to the cave paintings.
In many of the French caves, the archaeologists have noticed a strange relationship between the pictures and the rock itself. What is fascinating is the, um, the way they, they use the rock. Sometimes the whole body of the, the animal is contained in the shape of the, the rock. And it's just like they have been inspired by, um, by the detail, the, the, the shape. They just pass through and see, well, this is a mammoth, this is a horse. We found this everywhere. In looking at the Southern African rock art for a long time, we thought that they were just painting images on the rocks. But we then started realizing that they used specific natural features to enhance the image in some way. Some images come out of cracks in the rock. In this instance, it's not so much a crack as a line which they've drawn on the rock, and then they have a human leg with a knee and a calf and a hoof at the end coming out of this line in the rock. The archaeologists suspect that the rock face played the same role in the French caves, that its significance was spiritual. Perhaps the spirit world lay beyond the rock face, and these paintings were a way of bringing the spirit world and the real world together. Radio control. After years of studying the South African art, Dowson and Lewis Williams believe that at Peshmel II, the rock wall was a sacred place. The rock face itself is important, and that is why we have hand prints placed onto the rock, not just to make pictures of hands, but more to it than that. And the interesting thing is that here we've got hand prints. This lower one here, somebody would probably have had to, to lie down on the ground to make it. And then there are two other prints up here, one here and one here. And the important thing is the way in which these handprints were made, because when they placed the hand there and they blew the paint over the hand, the hand was then behind the paint. So the people saw the black, and it's only when they took the hand away that you saw the print. But the ritual of making it was that the hand goes behind the paint, and hence the hand reaches through into the spirit world. The rock, as it were, disappears. The membrane's gone, and we've made contact with the spirit world. For Lewis Williams, the paintings at Peshmel are dramatic evidence of trance, where shamans sought power through visions of the animal spirits behind the rock. I think they're looking for animals, both with their eyes and with their hands. And so the vision comes, and then they paint the vision on the rock, but the rock suggests the vision in a way, and they're seeking it. So there's a constant interaction going on between the person and the rock, which is a membrane between this world and the spirit world. So it's an interaction of two realms. yet but you will be fully alert and one you can open your eyes fully alert how are you fine what can you tell me about your experience now just general impression it's wonderful a feature of altered consciousness is the euphoria that many people experience afterwards People talk about heaven, and I think that's what it's like. How real did the experience feel? It was real. 
Yeah, perfectly real. Do you sense that this has any kind of aspects to it? Is it helpful to you, perhaps to other people? I know it's helpful to me. As far as to other people, I, I don't know. If other people could go there, then it would be good for them too. To the Jutuansi, the trances have a practical purpose. It's their way of healing people who are sick. But whatever it does for their health, it makes them feel good. The need to make sense of what the brain makes us feel is a universal quality. It's a function of our modern human mind. It's experienced in societies all over the world. Given that these are very different cultures, geographically distant, what we're having is not some kind of cultural diffusion. What we're having is people who are talented at getting into their own experience and being able to come back to us and report about those voyages, that those people were in South Africa, they were in France, and they were in a hypnosis lab in the US and anywhere else. I think this is a very important point because then it tells us there is something essentially human about these experiences. see that these people were thinking about not just the world that they were living in, but also other spiritual worlds, other realities, not just the re physical reality of their day-to-day -day existence. And not only that, but they were using graphic ways of portraying those different realities. We do that in our art today, we do it in our archaeology, we do it in all sorts of different ways of thinking about other realities. Maybe these people who made these paintings so long ago were very much like ourselves today. When the early archaeologists first discovered the Venus of Brassempuy, they felt they were dealing with pre-human creatures. They were wrong. Today, we know that the people in this cave 25,000 years ago had minds identical to our own. From this moment on, we know that we were truly human. In the next episode, we'll go back to the very start of the human story. In the forests and plains of Africa, 